and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech 24. I'm Julia Seeger. In this edition, we'll travel to Cuba where the online revolution is slow in coming, but some locals are now launching their own social networks to help Cubans connect to the internet and the rest of the world. And you don't want to miss this week's Test 24 as we transform the set into a chemistry lab. Through a series of scientific experiments, we'll explain complex phenomenons such as the principle of mass conservation and Pascal's law. Cuba is one of the world's least connected countries. The only internet access for most of its inhabitants is one of just over 300 government-controlled Wi-Fi hotspots spread across the island. But local social networks are starting to spring up, and many are hoping they'll be a catalyst for an online revolution in the country. Brian Quinn has the story. Young people thumbing their phones, absorbed in social media. It's one of the most common sites in the developed world. But here in Cuba, it's a rarity. This is Gaspar, a sleepy rural town in the center of the island. It's an unlikely setting for a tech revolution, but that may be what's happening, as homegrown social networks start to pop up in the communist nation. Gaspar Social is one of them, and it's breathing new life into its namesake town. Every evening I connect, and at night, in the morning, when I have nothing to do. Almost always at night I go on and chat with my friends. It started when four local techies set up a private Wi-Fi network for playing video games. Gradually, they added photo sharing, video and chat capabilities, and thus was born rural Cuba's answer to Facebook. In October, it opened to the general public. It's run on a local server network, unconnected to the wider internet, but its users are hooked all the same. And it wasn't long before Gaspar Social caught the attention of the country's communist authorities. They made clear that the current network is illegal. However, they weren't going to remove any of the antennas. Cuba has been gradually opening its economy in recent years. Its internet, however, remains strictly controlled. Most Cubans must pay $1.50 an hour to go online via sparse Wi-Fi hotspots run by the state telecom firm. Many here are hoping that small local projects like Gaspar Social can help push Cuba towards connectivity. Gaspar has changed a lot, really a lot. I even found love thanks to the social network. In the meantime, at least teenagers here will still have a reason to keep their noses glued to their phones. It's time to bring in our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello and welcome, Dan. Hello, Julia. Um, the government of Cameroon has recently ended its internet shutdown that had started in January and had sparked outrage across the country. But it had also helped create a new campaign called Bring Back Our Internet. That's right. The campaign under the hashtag Bring Back Our Internet was not only popular within the country, but also became popular internationally. And it helped uh, the activists in pressurizing the government to end this shutdown because it drew a lot of criticism from abroad. So that was the role played by uh, this hashtag. And speaking of hashtags, there's uh, another uh, NGO called Access Now that has also launched a ha hashtag called Keep It On. So the purpose of this hashtag is to ensure open and secure internet access to everyone uh, in this world. And now in the UK, researchers have just created a, a new tool to help access websites that are restricted by governments. That's right. The tendency to block websites is growing day by day, not only in particular region, but all across the world. Now, the university researchers in the University of Waterloo in Canada, they have launched a tool called Slithin that enables people to access the websites they want to without being monitored by the censors in the particular country. So what they do is they reshape the traffic. So, for example, if there is a certain website that is blocked or certain content that is forbidden to be accessed, then through this, uh, using this tool, you can access that content. But your, the trace or your uh, footprint, it won't show that you have accessed that particular. Instead, it will, it will show that you have accessed some very benign, very, I don't know, innocuous website like a cat's website. So that's the idea behind this project. Thank you, Dan. And stay with us for a very explosive Test 24. Dan and I are about to show some magic tricks. <laughs> Thank you. 
They're passionate about science and they want to share their knowledge with kids. The French company Les Savants Fous, in English The Mad Scientist, offers a series of fascinating hands-on experiments for children. And Professor Dan here has even slipped into his chemistry lab coat. Dan, before we start, please tell me all these experiments are safe and we're not going to have an explosion on the, on the set of Test 24. I can't guarantee that. Let's see what happens. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, but they're so absolutely safe. So let's start with the, yeah. with the first experiment. Uh, you're going to show us a chemical reaction that explains the principle of mass conservation uh, said in a more simpler manner. It means that nothing is lost, nothing is created, but everything is transformed. Who said that? I don't know. Yet. Antoine Lavoisier. Born he's in French. Paris. Yes, absolutely. French scientist. Yes, and he is called the father of modern chemistry, not only because he uh, he established this law, but also for many other reasons. For example, he uh, named oxygen and hydrogen. He also was the first person to determine that it's oxygen that is responsible for respiration and for combustion as well. And there are many other discoveries that he made. So let's focus on this important discovery. So here I have uh, vinegar. Mm -hmm. whose chemical name is acetic acid. I'm going to pour vinegar in this flask. Uh, I have with me here sodium bicarbonate. Okay. I'm going to put some of it inside a balloon. And once I have filled the balloon with enough uh, sodium bicarb, I'm going to attached, attach the balloon to the mouth of this flask and you'll see ideally the, when the law of conservation of mass as you mentioned it says that nothing can be created and nothing is destroyed right everything just gets transformed so as you can see here it's inflating now so what is happening is that uh, soda, sodium bicarbonate is reacting with acetic acid to produce sodium acetate and water and carbon dioxide normally I should I have a weighing scale so I should be weighing this. I should. So the, this is how it works. So the law of conservation of mass says that before the reaction, the weight of the reactants is the same as the weight of the products. So weight of the reaction I measured beforehand, it was around 204 grams. Now it's showing 204 grams. So same but, weight. Yes, but the earlier what used to happen is that scientists didn't understand where did the, what happened after the, for example, in many reactions, gas is produced and that gas just disappears. And when you weigh, you realize that this weight is less than the gas. So right. this is the gas that disappears. You don't see it. So they thought, oh, what's going on here? So Lavoisier and was the first to, exactly, to it's establish that it's, <laughs> it's, a law of, it's, it's a very important law because it has widespread applications in the field of chemistry, for example. And indirectly, because it's in chemistry, it's related to all everything that is related to synthetic products. Okay. So whether it's perfumes or whatever, on an industrial scale, this is the basis Let, of- Let's uh, go to the second yeah. experiment because we have a lot of experiments today. <laughs> Some of our, of our viewers are maybe wondering how submarines work and you're gonna help us understand that mechanism as well. Well, you mentioned in the introduction that we will be showing some magic and this is a piece of magic. So here I have a bottle filled with water. Inside it, I have a dropper and I've, I just inserted the dropper inside the bottle and now you'll see the magic, as I move my hand, the dropper will start moving. I know you don't believe me. I don't. Oh, come on. How did that work? You tell me. I have no clue. Well, I have some magic in my hand. No, it's very simple. It's uh, Pascal's principle. So here what happens is that when you apply, what I'm doing is I'm squeezing the bottle to make it move. Oh. <laughs> when I release the pressure, it goes back. So, as so how, I, how is that pressure? Yeah, so as I apply the pressure according to Pascal's law, inside, uh, in, a, in a closed system, for example, and uh, for a liquid that is not compressible, so water is not compressible, but air is. So for this type of liquid, when I apply pressure, it is uniformly distributed. So when I apply pressure here, it's the same pressure that acts inside every, in the, in the entire bottle. But the problem with this dropper is that there's a water bubble here that may, keeps it afloat. Right. There's a water, but when I squeeze it, the water enters the tube, and because air is compressible, but water is not compressible, so the air gets compressed, and as the air gets compressed, its density increases, and that's how it sinks. That's a similar so principle. So it wasn't your hand. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Simple science. <laughs> now tell us about uh, a property of water, its surface tension. We're gonna use this bowl it's, with it's water. It's a very important property because it ensures the survival of uh, the tiny living beings like insects. You see insects 
walking along the water without sinking. That's right. because of the surface tension of water. So essentially, surface tension is the attraction between water molecules. It is this attraction that makes it, though it is not very evident for us because we are quite heavy, so if I put my finger in it, it easily goes down. But still, on a, on a, on a, on a smaller scale, it acts as if it is uniform. It's like a piece of cloth. And that's what, it, that's what holds together all these uh, water molecules, and that's the surface tension. Now, to demonstrate it, I'm going to spray some pepper powder here. Yeah. And I'm going to dip my finger in, in this small container with soap. What is it, soap. oil? No, it's soap. Soap. And the moment I dip my finger in it, You'll see, right? It's moved to the periphery. To the sides. Yeah, exactly. Right. So the reason why this happens is because soap has a unique property of breaking the surface tension. So it breaks the bond between or the attraction between the two water molecules. The moment it does that, the water molecules which are on the top of the it's like cloth. So when you cut right. the cloth, it just falls apart. Right. Similarly, these water molecules on top of uh, on the surface, they fall apart, and uh, along with it, the pepper also goes on the side. Okay. And now in this last experiment, the goal is going to be to inflate a balloon uh, without a lot of efforts. So yes. how are we going to do that? That is uh, due to Bernoulli's principle. So if you could hold the end of it. Normally, it will take me a long time if I do keep, keep on inflating the normal way, blowing right. it all. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a deep breath. There you go. So that's the Bernoulli's principle. So what it means is that if there's a, an airflow, a strong airflow, then it creates a zone of low pressure. And because of this low pressure zone, it attracts uh, air from the higher pressure. And that's how you get so much air inside this tube in such a short uh, span of time. Thank you, Dan, for making chemistry so fun. And thank you for watching. You can watch it again on our website, france24.com.